everybody. It's great to be back with you. This is week nine, and it's hard to believe that we've been doing this for nine weeks, but uh, we really appreciate you tuning in, and uh, give me some feedback sometime if you're enjoying this. Uh, some people I know can't always get to Bible studies, and this might become one of the things we learn out of uh, this whole pandemic, and uh, if uh, this works out for a lot of people and they want to continue it, I, I really would entertain that idea. I enjoy being with you this way, and I know sometimes it's easier to maybe sit down at your leisure and be able to do a Bible study. And we've been kicking around different ideas. What's going to happen post-pandemic uh, to the church? How do we do things differently? What have we learned from all of this? And uh, keep praying for the church. Uh, I'll kind of let the cat out of the bag, so to speak. Uh, we're really looking to try to open up uh, probably the, maybe the first Sunday in June, Lord willing, uh, June 7th. And we're going to have a whole program on how we're going to do that. So uh, just be praying for us as we try to figure a way to do this and do it safely for everybody. But uh, love to see you all, long to be together. And uh, well, as we get started today, let's have a word of prayer. Dear Father, I just thank you so much for our Bible study together, and I pray, Father, that you will just open our hearts to your truth today. Holy Spirit, we need your direction. So many times we fail you. So many times we um, have things that we need to uh, turn away from and turn to you, and we pray, Lord, during this time of studying your word, uh, especially in the book of James, that you'll be showing us the areas that we need to really focus on that would make us more like you every day. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for leading us. Just continue to guide us now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, today I want to get right into our lesson. What good is it for a brother and sister if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds? We're looking at James, the second chapter, verse 14. Last week, in the first part of James 2, we looked at favoritism. And, you know, when you think about favoritism and treating people, uh, how would you say, differently because of rank or status or ethnicity or whatever, uh, that is not God's will. God loves all people. His desire is that all men and women would be saved. Not all will be, but that all would be. So when we look uh, at the Word of God uh, today um, in, in our today's culture, how many problems could be avoided if we treated everybody equally? If we treated them equally with respect and love and compassion and dignity, I uh, fear we'd have a whole lot less problems. I would amaz I'd be amazed to think that we'd probably have a whole lot less problems if we just followed the golden rule, <laughs> you know? And so anyway, today we want to look at lesson nine, and it is James, the second chapter, uh, chapter 2, and we're beginning with verse 14, and I'm going to read it for you. I love to do this with you. What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save them? Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and well-fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith, I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds, and I will show you my faith by my deeds. You believe there is one God? Good. <laughs> Even the demons believe that and shudder. You foolish person, do you want evidence that faith without deeds is useless? Was not our father Abraham considered righteous for what he did when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? You see that his faith and his actions were working together. Uh, and his faith was made complete by what he did. And the scriptures was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God, and it was credited him as righteousness, and he was called God's friend. You see, a person is considered righteous by what they do and not by faith alone. In the same way, was not even Rahab, the prostitute, considered righteous for what she did when she gave lodging to the spies and sent them off in a different direction. As the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without deeds is dead. Well, I hope you've brought your coffee with you and we're ready to jump into the scriptures here. In verse 14, it says, What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such a faith save them? 
what we're talking about here, and I'd like to kind of break this down into categories, but the first thing we want to look at is what we call deceptive faith. Uh, within this verse emerges an age-old debate about faith versus works. Uh, there are some who would say that James and Paul, the Apostle Paul, were at odds. Uh, that uh, James is teaching faith and works, whereas Paul was teaching only faith. But that's not exactly accurate. For Paul taught works can't save you, and his concept was what Martin Luther said when he got saved, and that was sola fide, by faith alone. And James seems to be saying that faith alone is not enough. It requires works. It appears there's a division when in reality they are saying the same thing, but from different perspectives. Paul's teaching on faith is focused on the time before conversion. As you notice, Paul was going into areas and he was teaching in uh, new areas uh, in Gentile regions, and he was calling them to a faith in Christ. And he was also teaching among Hebrews, uh, Israelites, and oftentimes, and many of them had this works-oriented righteousness. I do this, this, and this to kind of gain, to kind of gain God's favor. But Paul, in other words, he goes on to say, Paul's teaching on faith is focused on the time before conversion. In other words, you cannot work your way or earn your way into heaven. It is by faith. One of the verses that we encourage people to memorize in our, in our church is Ephesians 2, 8, 9, and verse 10. And it is a very simple uh, layout of the gospel, but it is so poignant. And I would encourage you to take some time and work on it in your own life. It could be very helpful, especially when you get with someone who is really wondering, what does it mean to be saved? I, almost every funeral I have, I share these concepts because I want people in the midst of even in, in dealing with the death of a loved one to think about their own spiritual identity or uh, their own spiritual eternity. Uh, what it says in Ephesians 2, 8, 9, and 10 says, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one could boast. That's 8 and 9. But verse 10 says something very poignant. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. So, as we look at this passage, it tells us, first of all, that we are saved through faith. And it isn't because of anything we've done. I like to tell people that Christianity is not a religion of human achievement. None of us are going to get into heaven because of what we've done. It'll always be because of what Christ has done. He opened the door. He made the way. And our faith and trust must be firm in him. But James is speaking to believers after conversion. You remember, he's talking to those who are scattered, uh, Christians who are uh, in persecution and all the difficulties. But he's talking to them, what I would call post-conversion, about the importance that works plays in our life. That works are the testimony. Because verse 10 says, for we are God's, verse 10 of Ephesians 2, 8, 9, and verse 10 says, for we are God's workmen. And, let me say that again. For we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. You know, if you look at your life and you're thinking, well, what have I done? Well, sometimes we as Christians, don't realize the investment we're making because we're just caught up in doing the things of God and we don't realize all the good maybe that we are doing. On the other hand, though, uh, it is important for us to ask, is my life making a difference for the kingdom of God? And if it isn't, then maybe we need to ask, do I even initially have that kind of a faith and uh, forgiveness and repentance before him? James is speaking of believers after conversion, but James is saying that your faith should make a difference in your life. And there is, and if there is no fruit, if there are no works, then we must question if we have faith at all. Oftentimes, different arenas of theology will talk about this, and uh, one will say of a person who is not living the way they should, according to Christ, well, they were never saved to begin with. Well, I think we need to just trust God that when a man or a woman gives their heart totally to Christ, it is, it's a permanent commitment to Christ. We need to trust Christ to carry us all the way through. But our works 
our lifestyle becomes a testimony of what we believe. So if there are no works, if we're not becoming more like Christ every day, we're demonstrating Christ-like love to others, his compassion to others. If we're not concerned about the loss, we better take a hard look and see if we're even saved. Because when you get saved, you're, you're, you're adapting the mindset of Christ. I want to be like Jesus. So Barna has released new studies that suggest that the church is using the wrong measuring stick for success. Many church use their budget and size of Sunday school and morning attendance, the size of facilities to determine success rate. But let's face it, there are a lot of dead churches out there with heavy endowments. They got a lot of money in the bank. They have huge facilities, and a lot of those facilities are not being used, not because of the coronavirus, but you know, way before coronavirus, there's a lot of dead churches around. The old adage, and I, I really struggle with it from the Field of Dreams, the movie says, build it and they will come. I, I don't agree with that. I believe Jesus said for us to go and take that message. Uh, none of that impresses God. Our buildings and, you know, the amount of money we have in the bank. What God wants to see is transformed lives. People who profess him as Savior and they believe and their faith opens their heart to the transforming power of the Holy Spirit. Their faith produces works in accordance with the will of God. You know, when I read Matthew, or I think it's Matthew 25. You remember that passage? We, I think we shared it early on in, the, the, in this study, but it was the separation of the sheep and goats. And he says to those in his right hand, when, when I was hungry, you fed me. When I was naked, you clothed me. When I was in prison and you visited me. When I was sick, you took care of me. You, you know the gist of what I'm saying here. It's in Matthew 25. But the interesting thing is these people didn't even know that. They didn't even realize they'd done those things. And they really didn't know that when they did them, they were doing them for Christ. Wow. When you say a kind word to somebody, are you thinking, hey, I'm speaking to Jesus here. I'm, I'm, I'm speaking the love of Jesus to somebody else. I know we don't go around trying to make a count of everything we do for the kingdom, but we need to understand that, that God wants our lives to shine for him. James poses a question to us, James 2.15, suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to him, go, I wish you well, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about his physical needs, what good is it? So in verses 15 and 16, he gives an illustration that should challenge us all. First of all, we need to pay attention. When you read that, suppose a brother or sister is without food and clothes and daily, you, you, you know the verse, I just read it. But first of all, I think we need to understand that we've got to have eyes open. We need to be looking at those around us and discerning by the power of the Holy Spirit and the active word of God in our lives, the needs of others. Maybe it's just a word of encouragement. Maybe it's a sack of groceries. Maybe it's just a helping hand on a project. Maybe it's a neighbor who you know is struggling and you, you just take time to go over and talk to them and just let them know you care about them. A lot of times I would say, to my neighbors is anything I can pray for you on, anything that I can be lifting you up on. And, and you know what's really important when you do that and they share something to go back to them a few days later. Hey, how's that going? I, I really care. It communicates that you really care about them and you should. But that person in need might be sitting right beside you at a restaurant or maybe at a family dinner table or at a family reunion or maybe at a funeral. Who knows where you might be, but to be alert to those people around us. Uh, all of us have problems, and we can lift each other's loads by coming alongside of one another. James asks the question, what good is it? <laughs> he says, suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. If one says to him, go, I wish you well, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about his physical needs, what good is it? So James is really saying, what good is your religion, your faith, your commitment to Christ really accomplishing? The only answer to that, if you're oblivious to those needs around you, then it's, the answer is none at all. It's not good for anything. In the same way, verse 17 says, 
by in the same way, faith by itself, if not accompanied by action, is dead. Our actions are the testimony of our faith. 1 John 3, 17 through 18 says, If anyone has material possessions and sees his brother in need but has no pity on him, how can the love of God be in him? Dear children, let us not love with words or tongue, but with actions and in truth. So, He's, in other words, he's not saying for us not to speak the truth and say nice things to each other, but there ought to be a little action in that attitude of, I do love you, and here's how I love you. True faith requires compassion and action. I was thinking about that even last night and this morning in preparing the notes for this. And I remember Galatians, the fifth chapter, and in Galatians, the fifth chapter, I believe, it says, I say, live by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the sinful nature. For the sinful nature desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the sinful nature. They are in conflict with each other, so that you do not do what you want. But if you are led by the Spirit, you're not under the law. So when we think about legalism as a binding thing, the law is a binding thing. Uh, but the Spirit wants to set us free to be able to minister and love and care and show compassion to others. And uh, the fruit of the Spirit, if you go on a little further in that text, says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. You know, just think about those fruit of the Spirit-led life, because he says, I say, live by the Spirit. You know, we really need to pay attention as a body of believers to how we're responding to the ministry of the Holy Spirit in our lives. We can't be afraid of him. He has come to do many things, and he is God's representative and, and our, our, our God embodiment right now, the Holy Spirit, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. He is here with us right now to the very end of the age. And so we need to rejoice, but it says live by the Spirit. And the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness. So when I think about those around me, how am I showing kindness? How am I showing goodness? How am I demonstrating patience and peace, love and joy? Uh, Colossians 3.12 kind of repeats some of that. It says, therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. So here we have our faith being linked to our spirit-led life. And out of that, should the, these fruits should emerge, and one of them is compassion. In the same way, faith by itself, James says, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by actions, is dead. He said, really, what it is, faith without actions is DOA, dead on arrival. You know, when I think about this church, and so many of you, I'm so excited about what I see among you. You are a testimony of faith in action. The ministries are a direct result of your faith and the well-being and your, your good works and what you're trying to do. Many of you give financially to the needs of others around you. I see you giving, and I, I know you give of your time, and, and some of you are out there helping others. I see you loving one another and reaching out to this community through Sports World, through East Richmond Christian Schools, through our needs many ministries, through divorce care, grief share, uh, family recovery, um, and, and through MOPS. Uh, so many wonderful ministries, though, that are kind of laid down for right now. We're hoping to see those up and rolling before long. But one of the things I want to encourage you to do, because we want to be people of faith and action. Faith in action. It's a good brain, doesn't it? But anyway, will you join me in prayer that God will lead the ministry and the elders, uh, the ministry team and the elders and the congregation to a new vision for reaching the valley. I, I, I'm praying for a post-pandemic vision. I'm praying that some of you uh, who maybe had grown a little laxed in coming to church and being supportive of the church, but now with this pandemic have gotten reignited in your faith, we're going to see a revival come out of this. That we won't go back to business as usual, but we'll come back with a new fervor, realizing that with a pandemic, anything can happen. And we only have so much time. So I'm praying for post-pandemic vision, 
that will enable us to reevaluate in the church what is important and how can we best honor Christ and grow in our faith and reach beyond the church doors to the community around us to take us to a new level of ministry to one another and to the community. Being a people of faith with transformed lives, we will see the kingdom of God grow. Pray that the Lord of the harvest, in doing so, this is what I'm, I'm looking forward to, pray the Lord of the harvest will send forth laborers into the field, for the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Then there's a what we call, when, when we began this, we were talking about uh, kind of a, how would you say it? How did I say it? A deceptive faith. But also, he talks here about what I call a demonic faith. And boy, it's demonic, all right. It says in James 2, 19, You believe there is one God? Good. Even the demons believe that and shudder. Hmm. Boy, that calls our attention to what I call a cheap grace. A grace that says verbally with their lips that I believe in Jesus, but there's no heart change. Clifton Jansky, uh, a Christian country singer uh, of the year a couple years ago, sings a song about uh, 18 inches from heaven. I, I've shared this with you before, those of you who attend regularly. Um, he says, I grew up in the church singing Jesus loves me, this I know. I never miss Sunday school. And I could quote lots of verses. I knew about the one who died for me, but he did not know me. I had him in my head, but not in my heart. For I had not believed I was 18 inches from heaven. <laughs> in other words, the distance between here and his heart. He said, that's how far, how close I was, but close is not close enough. You need to be in. I knew everything I needed to know that Jesus saves and he died for me. And on the third day he rose, but the things in my head had not made it to my heart. And I had acknowledged, I had acknowledged, but I did not have faith. Heaven for me was just out of reach. I was 18 inches away, the distance between my head and my heart. We're talking about a head knowledge versus a heart knowledge. You may remember another passage of scripture, and I think it's one of the scariest ones in scripture, one of the, one of the scarier ones. And it's, a, it's the account of Simon the sorcerer. You find it in the book of Acts. I, I should have looked up the exact reference for you, but in the book of Acts, uh, the, uh, they were doing ministry, and uh, this Simon the sorcerer, who was a pretty wicked man in his day, hears the gospel, sees the miracles. He wants to be a Christian. It says he, he confesses Christ. He is baptized, and he's following them around. And yet, he then tries to buy the power of the Holy Spirit so that he can distribute it, make money off of it. And you remember what Peter says, your heart is far from God. He called him to repent. Your heart is far from God. Well, we don't want a heart far from God. So we're talking about the importance of uh, having a heart right with God. Matthew 8, 28 through 34, uh, powerful passage of scripture. You may remember it. It's the, the passage about the demoniac at Gadara, a demoniac at Gadara. He said, when he arrived, the other, uh, Matthew 8, 28 through 34, says, when he arrived on the other side of the region of the Gerizines, two demon-possessed men coming from the tombs met him. They were so violent that no one could pass that way. What do you want from us, son of God? They shouted, have you... Come here to torture us before the appointed time? Some distance from them, a large herd of pigs was feeding. The demons begged Jesus, if you drive us out, send us into that herd of pigs. He said to them, go. They came out and went into the pigs. And by the way, that's where we get deviled ham. Just kidding. But anyway, so they came out and went into the pigs. And the whole herd rushed down the steep bank into the lake and died in the water. Those tending the pigs ran off and went into the town and reported all this, including what had happened to the demon-possessed men. Then the whole town went out to meet Jesus, and they saw him and pleaded with him to leave their region. <laughs> they couldn't understand the miracle that had taken place there. All they saw was the loss of money, which they shouldn't have been raising hogs in that region as Hebrews or whatever in any way. So, or anyway, but anyway, they may not have been Hebrews for all that goes. 
But what do you want with us, son of God, they shouted. Have you come to torture us before the appointed time? Those demons and those men that were so filled with demons, they recognized that Jesus was the son of God, but that didn't make them saved. Demons are not atheists. <laughs> they know there's a God and they fear him. Matthew 7, 15, 23 says, Watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. This is one of the things that the devil does. He masquerades around like angels of light. They, how do you show? They try to imitate God, but for wicked reasons. And they use subterfuge to break up the Christian community. Uh, by their fruit, you will recognize them. Do people pick grapes from a thorn bush or figs from thistles? Likewise, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. But every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into fire. Thus, by their fruit, you will recognize them. And we talked about that just a moment ago, some of the fruit of the Spirit. Do you remember some of those? The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. I kind of grew up in a very legalistic church for a period of time. and You know, a lot of times I didn't experience from Christian people much kindness or compassion I didn't really sense that they loved me. Oh, they were pretty quick to condemn me. They were pretty quick to criticize me, and rightfully so sometimes. But there wasn't a lot of compassion. There wasn't what I'd call a joyful, spirit-filled life. You know, as Colossians says, that uh, clothe yourselves with compassion and kindness Humility, gentleness, and patience doesn't mean that we don't help each other to do better, but it does mean that we ought to be very careful. Back then, I used to hear people say, well, that person's going to go to hell. I want to tell you what I think about that kind of a statement. If you're going to make that statement about somebody else, you ought to say it on your knees with tears in your eyes and only to the Lord pleading for their forgiveness. You see, we ought to be people of compassion and mercy. We need to be ready to help people come to the grace of God. And if all they experience from us is bitter rancor and criticism, then they're probably not going to really want to be like us. We need to be like Christ. They recognize, these demons recognize Jesus Anyway, I was interested in a quote I found from Patrick Henry. In his will, Patrick Henry wrote, I am now disposed of all my property to my family. There is one more thing I wish I could give them, and that is faith in Jesus Christ. If they had that, and I had not given them one shilling, they would be rich. If I had not given them that, and had given them all the world, they would be poor indeed. The bedrock of America is not her financial prosperity, but her spirituality. Patrick Henry clearly understood this truth, and so should we. What really matters is our heart. And the demons go around saying they believe. And there's a lot of people. If I went out to the High Valley Mall or the Plaza or whatever, and I interviewed lots of people, I just asked them a questionnaire, and I said, do you believe in God? Almost, all, I would venture to say a majority would say that. But that doesn't really mean, a lot of times that would mean they have a head knowledge. They know it exists. And they might even say, well, yeah, one time I prayed of their belief. But there's no fruit in their life that indicates there's ever been a transformational change in their heart. So, Paul talks about faith as a basis of conversion, and that is so true. But James also talks about actions that demonstrate what we truly believe. So I want to look at the next section in this passage, and that's what I call 
demonstrated faith. James 2.22 says, You see that his faith and his actions were working together, and his faith was made complete by what he did. So when we go back to our verses here, uh, I'm going to read verse 21 of chapter 2 of James. Was not our father Abraham considered righteous for what he did when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? You see that his faith and his actions were working together, and his faith was, his faith was made complete by what he did. So when we look at this, we might say actions speak louder than our words. And as we've pointed out in Ephesians passage, it talks so much about the importance of faith and how importance, how important it is to understand that our works do not save us. But it does go on and say that our we are created to do good works, and those works ought to testify to Christ. Two essential sir, truths then that we need to understand that salvation is by faith alone, by sola fide. Real faith produces good works. Our works become a testimony of what we believe. James 2.21 was not our ancestor Abraham considered righteous for what he did when he offered his son Isaac on the altar. You see that his faith and his actions were working together and his faith was made complete by what he did. And the scripture fulfilled that says Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness and he was called God's friend. You see that a person is justified by what he does and not by faith alone. In the same way, was not even Rahab the prostitute considered uh, righteous for what she did when she gave lodging to the spies and sent them off in different directions? As the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without deeds is dead. You see that faith and his actions together we're working together in Abraham's life. Working together tells us uh, working together tells us that his faith was not isolated event in the offering of his son, but faith and works were continually characteristic of Abraham's life before and after the event. Hebrews 11 says, by faith, Abraham, when called to go to a place he would later receive as his inheritance, obeyed and went, even though he did not know where he was going. By faith he made his home in the promised land like a stranger in a foreign country. He lived in tents as did the Isaac and Jacob, who were heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to a city with foundations whose architect and builder is God. By faith Abraham, when God tested him, offered his Isaac as a sacrifice. He who received the promise was about to sacrifice his one and only son. Wow, what a commitment that was on Abraham's part. He becomes a, a, a testimony of what God would do with his own son, offering him for each and every one of us. Abraham started out in faith. He sojourned in faith. He sacrificed his son in faith. And uh, Ephesians, or Genesis 15, 6 says, Abraham believed the Lord and it credited to him as righteousness. Well, I want to tell you a secret in Abraham's life when he took his son to the uh, offer him on the mountain. It says in Genesis 22, 4 through 5, On the third day, Abraham looked up and he saw the place in the distance. He said to his servant, Stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over. We will worship and we will come back to you. You know, I think about that walk up that mountain. Here's Abraham, an old man. I believe Isaac was pretty good size. He probably was uh, maybe early, late teens even. I imagine he was pretty stout. He was carrying all the wood. And he looks at his father and says, Dad, we've got the fire and we've got the wood. He even got the knife, I think. But where's the lamb? And Abraham said, God will supply. Can you imagine those moments as they built that altar together? They laid that wood out on that altar and they prepared for the sacrifice. And then Abraham places his own son on it with quivering hand and a faith in God. He's ready to plunge the dagger. But the voice of God says, don't take his life, I'll provide. And God 
has provided for every one of us who would believe on the name of Jesus Christ. Hebrews 11, 17 through 19 says, By faith Abraham, when God tested him, offered Isaac as a sacrifice. He had received the promises, was about to sacrifice his one and only son, even though God had said to him, through Isaac, your offspring will be reckoned. Abraham reasoned that God could raise the dead. And figuratively speaking, he did receive Isaac back from the dead. What sort of faith do you have? Is it a head knowledge? Or is it a heart knowledge? A few years ago, I got a call. One of those calls you don't want to get. I had to do a funeral for a cousin. She was 56 years old. She'd been killed in a car wreck. She was pretty special to me. It was early in the morning and she was on her way to work. Maybe she was thinking about her schedule that day or the activities of that evening. Maybe she was thinking about her kids or her grandchildren. They say she never even got a chance to hit the brakes. The car turned right in front of her, and she was pronounced dead. One minute in this world, and the next minute, with no warning, you're ushered into eternity. At that point, it's too late. What do you believe? What evidence is there of your faith? Remember what James said, faith without works is dead. Your works become a testimony of what you believe. I say this to say to you, if you don't know Jesus, if you're not certain about your eternal destiny, I didn't really plan on making this a preaching sermon, but if you don't know Christ, my phone number is available to you at any time here at the church, 740-695-0971. And if you want to call me to talk to me on my cell phone, it's 740-391-6621. I'm not hiding from anybody. I'm here to tell you that you can have eternal hope in Christ Jesus. God bless you. See you next week. <laughs>